So when I think of data-centric engineering, I think of theorems, algorithms, and computational heuristics within the fields of uncertainty quantification, dimension reduction, and machine learning. When I think of error engines, I think of these complex machines that are, at their core, are driven by this simple philosophy, suck, squeeze, bang, blast. The modern error engine comprises of four major subsystems. At the front, we have the fan that's tasked with sucking in a large volume of air at a high speed. Some of that air is passed on to the core compressor that is tasked with compressing the air, and it squeezes the air to a pressure ratio of anywhere from 30 to 1 to 50 to 1. This compressed air is then passed on to the combustor, where it is mixed with fuel and ignited, thus the bang. This high pressure, high temperature, and thus high energy air then gets ushered through the turbine, where work is extracted from it. What's left of the air then gets sent straight out, blasted out through the nozzle, uh, and that, that injection of high velocity air, and thus momentum, is what pushes the aircraft forward in a direct consequence of Newton's third law. So over the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to walk you through what I think are the three relevant challenges in data-centric aero engines. The first one concerns how we accurately measure the performance of our engine. And by performance, I mean efficiency and specific fuel consumption. Then we're going to talk about how we can design within the massive multidisciplinary design space within an aero engine. And finally, I'm going to talk about how we can develop trust within our computational simulations. To tackle each of these challenges, I propose the following key strategies. So with respect to accurately measuring the performance, we're going to try to rigorously understand what drives efficiency and how we can reduce uncertainties in its measurement. With respect to the design challenge, we're going to le leverage dimension reduction strategies for innovation in both design and manufacturing. And finally, on the last point, I'm going to talk about how we can facilitate more realistic models of flow physics simulations with techniques arising from both aleatory and epistemic uncertainty quantification. So in a sense, it's a combination of aerodynamics, specifically turbomachinery aerodynamics, and algorithms and techniques from data-centric engineering. OK, so let's talk about the first challenge, accurately measuring performance. So this is a cutaway of an engine. And for the next 10 or so minutes, we're going to be focusing on the LP turbine, which is all the way at the back of the engine between the IP or intermediate pressure turbine and the nozzle. The inlet of the low pressure turbine, as you see over here, is denoted by 0, 01 and the exit by 0, 02. So this essentially represents our control volume. Now, at both the inlet and the exit planes, we're going to measure a few quantities. The first one is the stagnation pressures, i.e. PO1 and PO2. Then the stagnation temperatures, T01 and T02. And we can also get a sense of what the specific heat ratio is. So usually, it's about of the order of 1.4. So armed with these quantities, we can then estimate what the efficiency is. And this is kind of your, your standard um, isentropic efficiency formula. So given a control volume, given these measurements, you can plug those values in, and you can estimate what the efficiency is. Now, because we have an analytical formula for efficiency, we can compute the partial derivatives of efficiency with respect to the different parameters you see over there. So we go ahead and compute the partials. And then we're going to multiply each of the partials by the measurement uncertainty, denoted here by the red sigma value. So for example, for the measurement uncertainty associated with uh, the inlet total pressure measurement, we have sigma p01, and so on for the other quantities. Then what we do is we take each of these individual measurement uncertainties, and we square them. And we end up with a plot that looks like this. So what this plot tells you is that when you're measuring efficiency, your stagnation temperatures are roughly an order of magnitude more important than your stagnation pressures. In other words, in order to measure efficiency accurately, I really need a good measurement of my stagnation temperatures. We're going to pursue this line of thought a bit further. So what I can do 
is I can, using this analytical expression I just showed you, I can construct a first order Taylor series approximation to efficiency as a function of all its components. Or I can just use standard Monte Carlo sampling to figure out what the uncertainty in efficiency is given the uncertainty in stagnation pressures and temperatures. So assuming that stagnation temperatures and stagnation pressures are independent, I get an efficiency uncertainty of roughly 1.3%. So this is important because if you are optimizing your low pressure turbine and you manage to get an increase in efficiency of 0.5%, you have no hope of discovering that. So the question therefore becomes what can we do in order to reduce that quantity you see over there? So what's interesting is that if we assume the temperature measurements are positively correlated, so here what I'm doing is I'm just generating samples from uh, multivariate Gaussian with a correlation coefficient of approximately 0.8. And when I plug those values in, I end up with an efficiency uncertainty of 0.34%. So now if you do optimize your low pressure turbine and you do get an increase in 0.5%, you should be able to detect that. Now, measurements are correlated when they are calibrated end-to-end -end against the same standard. And this is a practice that's actually in use to reduce the uncertainty in uh, any calculation of efficiency. So this is great. But the key thing here is that we've assumed certain values of sigma t01 and sigma t02. And my focus is on the temperatures here, largely because of this graph over here, which tells us that stagnation temperatures are way more important than stagnation pressures. So I'd like to get a more rigorous understanding of how exactly we can go about computing sigma t01 and sigma t02. Okay, so let's talk about temperature measurements. We need to, in an engine, measure temperatures ranging from minus 60 degrees Celsius to about 2,000 degrees Celsius. And the number of parameters we're measuring can range anywhere from 500 to 1,000. In some cases, in certain temperature stations, the precision needs to be less than 0. 0.0 degrees Celsius. A key challenge that arises is, well, how do we go about bookkeeping all the individual sources of measurement uncertainty? Now, just to give you an idea, we're going to focus on a single plane. So once again, we return back to our low-pressure turbine system and we focus on this plane des denoted by 0, 1. Right? Now, usually when you do uh, an engine measurement, so this is something I got of an old Agar report, this actually shows you the location of the circumferential, circumferentially located rakes. So you have rakes for total temperature and you have rakes for total temperature measurements. And we're going to be focusing on the total temperature measurements. So this is how an isolated temperature rake looks like. And the main thing to note is that on a, on a rake, you have a series of different thermocouples. And if you zoom into one of these thermocouples, this is what you end up seeing. So this is where our journey starts. We're going to start to aggregate the uncertainties all the way from here and then gradually scale up. So the first uncertainty comes from the velocity. So what we're trying to measure is stagnation temperature, but we don't actually measure stagnation temperature. right? So we want to measure TT, shown in red, but we end up measuring TJ, i.e. the stagnation temperature measured at the junction. What's happening here is as we are trying to bring this air that has a certain velocity to a complete rest, thus the stagnation temperature, uh, we end up with an uncertainty that arises from the fact that we're not able to completely bring it to uh, rest adiabatically. So that process is not adiabatic. So you end up with this recovery factor that's shown over here that can be obtained from experimental calibrations. That recovery factor has a certain uncertainty associated with it, right? So that's kind of your first source of uncertainty is, well, what is that recovery factor? The next source of uncertainty arises from the notion of conduction uncertainty, right? So all the thermal energy that's in the flow Right, is passed on to this thermocouple junction by convection. And in an ideal world, you would expect that thermal energy to be transferred along the wire by a conduction. 
i.e. the thermal energy via convection is equal to the thermal energy via conduction. But that's not the case. And so you have this conduction uncertainty term that is dependent on two constants. So the coefficient of convective heat transfer, Hc, and the coefficient of thermal conductivity, Ks, in addition to, obviously, the length of the thermocouple wire itself. So this is our second source of uncertainty. Our third source of uncertainty stands for radiation. Right? So we have three sources of radiation here. We have radiation from the thermocouple junction to the inner shield, radiation between the, the inner shield and the outer shield, and finally, radiation between the outer shield and the uh, annulus wall. This radiation here is a function of the emissivity, um, which is determined by the material you use. Now, in addition to these three sources of uncertainty, we also have any static calibration uncertainties, i.e. uncertainty stemming from the fact that you actually don't measure temperature, you don't measure Kelvin, you measure a change in voltage, usually millivolts, and you have to convert that to Kelvin. So there is an uncertainty associated with that. There's also an uncertainty associated with the fact that you're averaging over time, usually. Right? So you run your experiment for a certain amount of time, and then you do an average. So if we aggregate all these sources of uncertainty, we get a sense of, for an individual thermocouple, what exactly is the temperature it's measuring? What is the stagnation temperature it's measuring? It's important, however, to bear in mind that this is just an isolated thermocouple. And reality, in reality, we're interested in the entire spatial field of temperature. So what we do here is we compute the marginal Gaussians associated with each of these individual measurements, and then we construct this correlation matrix shown over there. Then we build a data-driven model that uses a Fourier series expansion in the circumferential direction and a polynomial extrapolation in the radial direction. The number of rakes and the frequencies that are usually involved uh, aren't sufficient for us to leverage sparsity. So we don't leverage any of the uh, compressive sensing type algorithms. So we opt for a standard multivariate least squares model with a bit of regularization uh, denoted here by the lambda value with the aim of trying to fit the first few harmonics because we only have a certain number of rakes. So this optimization problem it's not really an optimization problem because we usually set omega to be certain values, and those values are determined by uh, assumed aerodynamic modes. So when we solve it for this, we essentially get an estimate of what the spatial field should look like. And this formulation permits us to propagate the uncertainty in individual temperature measurements based on that correlation matrix as well. So here, sigma, uh, here B is essentially a multivariate normal distribution with the mean of B and the covariance matrix associated with the measurements I showed you previously. And using this, we can get the mean stagnation temperature as well as the variance in the stagnation temperature you see over there. OK, so once again, you know, this is just the story of a single isolated plane in an engine. right? Um, and so. Just to mention that you know, if you take a slice through this, you get a sense of how good your fit is. Because um, ultimately, when we solve this problem, we're interested in minimizing uh, the residual in the two norm. So this is how I see the road ahead for data-centric temperature measurements. We like to combine such annulus models, so this is essentially for the entire annulus, with more detailed rig data, which essentially give us a sense of the the spatial field between successive blades. And we'd like to do this not for an isolated temperature plane, but for many planes and for many engines. So this is something that we see as being incredibly data intense. So once you have a spatial field for temperature, it doesn't really end over there, right? Because if you recall, efficiency requires a scalar value of your stagnation temperature. And so the question then becomes, well, how do you go from this spatial field to a single scalar value associated with total temperature? Now, usually that process involves some sort of averaging, either an area average, either a mass average. So there are uncertainties that can crop into that, given the fact that we don't necessarily measure or have mass flow measurements always at all the different temperature uh, measurement planes. Moving forward, we'd like to be able to integrate this analysis into 
the preliminary design methodologies, i.e. for a new engine, what will the uncertainty in temperature be? Okay, so this essentially wraps up, I suppose, the first challenge. And I'm now going to focus on the second challenge, which is how do we design with dimension reduction? So for the last several years, there's been a lot of research on a fundamental level into dimension reduction, into the methodologies, into ensuring that the computational algorithms and heuristics uh, that arise are scalable. So you can actually run them uh, in reasonable time scales. So this part is actually split into two kind of uh, parts. So the first one is all about discovery uh, in that how do we use these, these algorithms, these techniques to actually find uh, dimension, uh, how do we find these dimension reducing subspaces? I'm largely going to be interested in subspaces. And the next part is how do we really exploit them for design? Okay, so this is, this is the abstraction, right? So we have some function, f of x, uh, that represents some objective I'm interested in. f of x could be the efficiency, it could be the pressure ratio, it could be the flow capacity, it could be whatever you want. Uh, and x would essentially represent my design variables, what I can change. So let's assume that here f is efficiency, so it's some high dimensional function that depends on certain design variables. And a lot of you have probably run into this problem where you're trying to do some sort of parametric study, some design of experiment, perhaps even an optimization, and you realize, oh gosh, my model has too many parameters. And so the key there is dimension reduction, right? So our objective is to take f of x and approximate it with a function g of m transpose x. So let's, let's make some assumptions. Let's assume that efficiency is a 25-dimensional function. And x here, obviously, is a vector that has 25 elements in it, right? We're going to approximate f of x with another function, g of m transpose x. So in the case where m is a matrix, so imagine m is some 25 by one matrix. So m transpose x is just one, right? So that makes g a univariate function. Now, if m was 25 by two, that would make g a bivariate function. So the key thing here is, how do we compute m? And there's been a lot of research on this. So some work goes back all the way to the 80s with projection pursuit regression, sliced inverse regression, sliced average variance estimation. So these were all essentially from the statistics community. More recently, there's been a lot of work from the uncertainty quantification community. So there's uh, active subspaces from Paul Constantine uh, and also polynomial variable projection. Now, all these techniques require data. And here we're going to generate this data using computational models of the blade. So this is the active subspaces strategy. You're essentially trying to construct this covariance matrix that's also defined as the averaged outer product of the gradient, right? So assuming you have access to the gradient of a function, you construct this matrix, figure out what its eigenvalues and eigenvectors are, and you rotate your coordinates and separate them in the following fashion. Here, when I talk about the eigenvalues, I'm essentially trying to split the eigenvalues, much like you would do in PCA, right? So based on the, on the decay of your eigenvalues, you would select that little m over there. So w1 would be, quote unquote, your active variables, right? So that's where your function's really changing a lot. And your inactive variables, i.e. w2, would be where your function is nearly constant. So that's how you would pick um, your, your uh, value of m. And then finally, once you have w1, it's, it's trivial to, to, to figure out what m is. So this is one recipe. There are a ton of other recipes. Here's another one. So this is something uh, we recently did, where the idea is you split your design, you split your samples into train, a training and testing set. You initialize some random orthogonal matrix. So here you would have to know what m is. So you would know the size of this orthogonal matrix. Um, and then you iterate. So this is uh, a dual loop optimization, where on the one hand, you're solving this problem. You're s essentially trying to figure out the best hyperparameters that minimize that functional. Um, and then once you've solved that, you iterate with the next step, where you're solving this manifold optimization on the Grassmann using conjugate gradients. And you can go essentially back and forth between these. So these are two different recipes. Um, 
However, they require a computational model. And here we're going to use computational fluid dynamics. So essentially, we have a geometry. We have a CAD representation of said geometry. And we have this parametric mesh where we can perturb the mesh uh, through certain design variables. And in this case, we're going to end up using 25 design variables. OK, so design space comprised of 25 variables. Uh, we break these up into five degrees of freedom uh, specified at five spanwise locations. So the spanwise locations are 0, 25, 50, 75, and 100, so all the way at the tip. Uh, and the five degrees of freedom are as follows. So there's dihedral, which is essentially a perturbation along the axial direction. There is sweep, which is a perturbation along the tangential direction. Leading edge and trailing edge recambering, uh, which essentially recambered the leading and the trailing edges respectively. And finally, skew, which is a rotation about the centroidal axis of the blade. OK, so now what we do is we, we have our design space. We have our CFD. We generate some design of experiment, right? So what we're going to do is we just sample uniformly using standard Monte Carlo. And we use one of the aforementioned strategies to figure out what M is. Um, just a quick note on the computational simulation. So we're going to use these Reynolds average and average Stokes models, right? So your standard uh, finite volume round solvers. Um, it's essentially the computational workhorse across a myriad of industries. And it's compromised between resolution and speed because you're not really uh, resolving turbulence, you're modeling it using a specific turbulence models. And much in the same way as you would in reality, we compute efficiency using stagnation temperatures and stagnation pressures. Okay, so assuming you have your design of experiment, right? so you have your x and you have your f of x, you can use one of the aforementioned techniques to figure out what m is. You project all your x's onto that subspace that's defined by m transpose. And this is uh, a result that we obtain for flow capacity. So our f here is flow capacity. So what does this tell us? Well, this essentially tells us that even though our problem was 25 dimensional, turns out flow capacity lies on some linear combination of all our 25 design variables. And as you walk along this vector, so imagine a vector in 25 dimensional space, as you take steps along this vector, flow capacity increases almost linearly. So this is fantastic. We can also inspect the components of this vector, right? So you can imagine your standard linear regression model, right? You can inspect the weights associated with that re regression model. And this can provide clues into what parameters are important. So we always get asked this question, well, what is the, the aerodynamic consequence of this? And I think this really tells a telling story. So what I'm showing you is how the design changes if you were to walk along this vector in 25 dimensions. So this explains what drives flow capacity. So if you look at the shape of the blades, so you're essentially looking at the blades all the way at the tip. So, that's, so that would be your leading edge. That's your trailing edge. And what you observe is as we move towards higher and higher flow capacity values, the blades tend to open up. And that's something that we teach first year turbo machinery students, right? So what drives flow capacity? But we didn't learn this from a first year turbo machinery textbook. We learned this just by inspecting uh, the weights associated with them. We can get a little more aerodynamic analysis, so we can start looking at the change in the inlet angles, the outlet angles, the camber distributions at both 75 and 95% span as we walk along this vector. We can do the same thing for efficiency. So it turns out efficiency is actually a function uh, of M transpose X, where M actually has two columns instead of one. And it, it almost has this kind of quadratic nature to it, as you can see over there. If you were to look at this contour plot from above, you'd end up with what you see on the left-hand side. Now, what's interesting is we, we picked this vector, largely arbitrarily, but we wanted to look at designs over here. So this would essentially be a region where you have high efficiency designs. right? And so we picked this vector, and we said, OK, let's take equidistant steps along this vector and explore both efficiency and pressure ratio. What we observed is that efficiency varies almost quadratically. So each of those points there, surprisingly, is an actual CFD simulation. And pressure ratio decreases linearly 
This is how the design changes as we go from low efficiency values to high efficiency values. And this tells you that in order to get higher efficiency values, the blade wants to have less camber. So as we go over there, you start to see uh, a decrease in the, in the camber over there. And it's probably a bit more clear over here. So if you look at the camber line distributions at 95 and 75% span, you can see the gray line tends to be a little more flatter um, as we go towards higher efficiency values. The next objective is pressure ratio. So what you see here are contours of pressure ratio along its subspace. The key thing to bear in mind that the M transpose for each of these functionals is different. What's interesting about pressure ratio is its trend seems to be far more quadratic, which is what you observe here. So you could easily fit a quadratic model to this data set on this computed subspace. And once again, the story from pressure ratio, and this is something we, we would teach a first year turbo machinery student, is that in order to increase the pressure ratio, you need to add more camber to the blade. And that's precisely what you observe. So as we walk along that vector, you can see an increase in camber. And so it's almost that in order to increase pressure ratio, I'm inadvertently going to decrease efficiency. Right? That's, that's the interpretation uh, from these two different videos. Okay, so, so far, to summarize, we've essentially determined that given our design parameterization, we have been able to find these reduced dimensions associated with three different functionals. But how do we really exploit them? So before I talk about exploitation, uh, I want to talk a bit about something called zonotopes. So imagine I gave you a cube, right? Based on how you would rotate it, its silhouette or its shadow would either have four edges or six, as you see over here, right? And it all, it all boils down to the rotation angle um, that you would use. We can do this for a three-dimensional object, no problem. Obviously, for a five-dimensional object, it becomes a little more tricky. But you still would be able to compute its silhouette based on its rotation. So now that we have a 25-dimensional hypercube, how does its silhouette look like? So we can, there, are algor there are algorithms to compute what, what that silhouette, what that zonotope will look like. And that's exactly what you're seeing over here. So the way to interpret this is that this is essentially your entire design space projected on a 2D plane. Furthermore, what it tells us is that during the course of our sampling, there are these vast stretches of the design space that we haven't really explored. Now, the part of the design space I'm really interested in is over here, right? Because this is where we tend to observe higher efficiency designs. And it kind of tails off over here. So ideally, I'd like to be able to figure out what the contours over here look like. So we're going to do precisely that, right? So I'd like to know at these specific points what the efficiency of the design looks like. And just to get a sense of completeness, I also want to know what the efficiency at these other points looks like. Now, here's the problem, right? We've gone from 25 dimensions to two dimensions. But how do we go from two dimensions to 25? This is a well-defined forward map, right? You can go from high dimensions to low dimensions. But when you're trying to go from low dimensions to high dimensions, you have this loss of information, right? Um, and so here's, here's the essence of, of this active subspace. What it says, and if you remember what I said earlier, along your active subspace, your function varies a lot. Along your inactive subspace, your function is, is nearly constant. And so the intuitive idea is that even though the inverse map can have many different designs, theoretically, the efficiency of these many designs should be roughly the same. So a really, really simple hack to generate different designs that will map to the same 2D coordinate, but yet be slightly different in 25 dimensions, would be to solve this simple linear program. So we're minimizing a dummy function that's always 0, so that's great. But the key thing is that we want to adhere to these constraints. right? So we'd like our x, so our new x that's generated, to lie within the original design bounding box. And I've just non-dimensionalized everything. So it has to be between negative 1 and 1. 
And obviously, I'd like it to be corresponding to these two, 2D coordinates. Right? So I know the 2D coordinate, and I'd like to figure out what the, what the x is. So we go ahead, generate a few different design vectors. We run the CFD, and this is what we get. So you can clearly see that the pattern does kind of fall into place. So as we go in this direction, we do observe higher efficiency designs. Now, the one point I want to make regarding this is that we actually tested about five different designs for each point. right? So you get five 25-dimensional vectors that are different from each other. But when we ran the CFD, the errors between them was nearly negligible. OK, so we talked about efficiency, but let's get back to our other two objectives, namely flow capacity and pressure ratio. Now, the problem with this graph is that this is plotted in a different subspace to efficiency. And what we'd like to do is be able to visualize all these objectives on the same 2D map. Right? So what I'm going to do here is, for each red square you see here on the efficiency subspace, I can generate a design vector, i.e. an x that has 25 elements in it. Now, because I have an x, and because I know what m here is, I can project it onto the flow capacity subspace right, using the forward map. So when we use this strategy, we can figure out how flow capacity varies on the efficiency subspace. And so what this tells us is that as we're increasing efficiency, i.e. if we want to go in that direction, we're naturally going to have a loss in flow capacity. But it tells us a little more than that. Rather than just giving us that statement, it's telling us by how much. So we can get a quantitative sense based on the change of these contour values. We repeat the same thing for pressure ratio. But in order to do that, we approximate pressure ratio with a quadratic model. Recall earlier I mentioned that the contours of pressure ratio were quadratic, so we do fit a quadratic model over there. And now that we have this forward map, we can go ahead and figure out what pressure ratio looks like on that subspace. And that's the result. So once again, if you were to increase the efficiency, you would inadvertently decrease the pressure ratio. And if you remember the videos that I showed you, they essentially tell us the same, right? Pressure ratio, it wants to add more camber to the blade, whereas efficiency wants less camber. So you can visualize these three contours on the same 2D map. And this is essentially what you get. So this is essentially a zoomed in version of the efficiency subspace. So these are the colors you see correspond to the efficiency values. And what I'm also plotting for you are pressure ratio values. Right? So this would represent decreasing cruise pressure ratio. And the contour lines in this direction represent uh, decreasing flow capacity values. So this is, a, a, I think, a terrific way to visualize, to navigate the design space, because you're looking at the change in multiple objectives uh, with respect to the design. It's important to mention that this isn't just a one-off. right? So being slightly cynical myself, um, I try this on several different blades. Uh, and what's interesting is because these subspaces are underpinned by physical phenomena, you get similar results, right? So these are for three different blades. Uh, and efficiency turns out to be more or less quadratic. And pressure ratio tends to be more or less linear on a certain subspace. And once again, that subspace is defined by a linear combination of, of your, in this case, 25 design variables. Naturally, you can extend this to multiple points along the characteristic. So I showed you this example of a fan. So as with every turbo machinery component, you don't just have one operating point. You have multiple. So you, you would have uh, a working line at cruise, a working line at sea level. And on that working line, you have different points. And so for each point, you can still apply the same machinery that I've showed you previously uh, and essentially get these subspace maps. OK, let's talk about manufacturing. Because the key thing with dimension reduction is, is it's not just about innovation in design, but it's also about innovation in manufacturing. And so here's, here's the intuitive idea. right? And recall what I said earlier, that along your important variables, or along this subspace, your function changes a lot. And along these unimportant variables, or this 
unimportant subspace, your function is near constant. So intuitively, the idea is if you, if you increase the tolerances, manufacturing tolerances, along these unimportant variables, that shouldn't necessarily change your functional of interest, i.e. efficiency. So if we define uh, a matrix M, so M here is, it can be obtained through any of the techniques I mentioned earlier. So it's almost apathetic to that. Um, we can split X into important and unimportant variables. And the idea is we like to increase the tolerances along N transpose. And if anything, tighten the tolerances along M transpose. So the idea is you can come up with heuristics that can randomly generate blades that will have uh, adhere to meeting a certain efficiency, but they permit a little more tolerance during the manufacturing process. If you're interested in identifying what the impact of a specific manufacturing mode is, you can do that as well. So once again, once you have this subspace representation, you fit a response surface on that subspace for your quantity of interest, and you can estimate for, in this case, just for that leading edge recambering degree of freedom, what does the uncertainty and efficiency look like? And so these contours would essentially be based on uh, known manufacturing tolerances. OK, so that concludes the second challenge. And now, in what remains, I'd like to talk a bit about trusting computational simulations. Because in what you, you've seen previously, uh, you would have noted that we've essentially placed a blind trust in the output of CFD. So we give it an x, and we get an f of x, and we're assuming that f of x is representative of reality. So within the turbo machinery community, there's been tremendous research on propagating aleatory uncertainties. And um, because of the ease in both implementation, uh, as well as the number of evaluations required, there's generally been a large focus on polynomial ca chaos type techniques. And these techniques essentially leverage the fact that most of your output quantities of interest are both radially averaged as well as circumferentially averaged. So they're actually quite smooth with respect to changes in both your boundary conditions um, and your design variables. So there's been a lot of application on using polynomial chaos techniques in uh, different turbo machinery pro problems as you see in these references. One interesting application of polynomial chaos techniques uh, has been NASA Road of 37. So there's been a lot of work that's been done on looking at revisiting NASA Road of 37. Main thing about this compressor blade was that for about 25 years, most of the CFD that was done on this compressor blade was off. So years of validation without uncertainty quantification. In 1997, Shabir et al. hypothesized that the reason for this discrepancy, so essentially the discrepancy was that at the hub, there was a total pressure deficit that the CFD could not obtain, but that was present in the experiments. So Shabir et al. came up with the idea that because there's a small gap between the rotating disk and this upstream, upstream stationary center body, that resulted in the small leakage flow that caused a total pressure deficit. So we went ahead and propagated the uncertainty in this by constructing a detailed uh, cavity mesh. We assume that the boundary conditions associated with that, that leakage flow were uncertain. And we went ahead and propagated it using a sparse polynomial chaos technique. What this essentially tells you is that with factoring into account that leakage uncertainty, we were able to explain some of the total pressure deficit we observed. So, to conclude the, the aleatory perspective, if you will, while numerous techniques for propagating turbo machinery CFD exist, there are a ton of open source codes as well, there are still some areas where further research is required. First one is practical sampling strategies with polynomial least squares. So over the last several years, we've seen this change from using tensor grid based polynomial approximation approaches to uh, leveraging least squares and even some techniques that use compressive sensing, i.e. that is you, most of your coefficients are zero. But adaptivity still seems to be uh, an open question. The next item would be how do we leverage gradient or adjoint evaluations now that that's becoming more and more commonplace. 
And then finally, how do we deal with correlation? So usually your inputs are never really fully independent. Maybe there is a correlation matrix associated with your input, so how do you truly leverage that? And in, on that point, there has been some work done on Nataf and Rosenblatt transforms, but there's still a lot more that needs to be done. And finally, the key thing to note is that when we're propagating aleatory uncertainties, our casing is never perfectly symmetric. Blades have manufacturing variations, and thus periodics, so if you're simulating an isolated blade row, that may not capture some of the physics. You may have leakage flows, so there are all these different sources of aleatory uncertainties, and obviously propagating all of them for a single blade is computationally incredibly intensive, so we really need to focus and figure out which ones are really important. So just a simple example is that if I, if I have a compressor blade that for some reason is hub four loaded, I would focus on the impact of hub leakage flows. Okay, so I'm just gonna wrap up by giving you a perspective on some of the work that's been done on the epistemic side. So here we're essentially looking at uh, a deeper understanding of the uncertainties, the structural uncertainties in RAND's turbulence models. And it boils, starts with the Reynolds decomposition that you see over here, where you're essentially trying to approximate a fluctuating quantity with a mean. Um, sorry, you're trying to approximate your velocity with the mean quantity and a fluctuating a component. Um, and when you put this decomposition into your Navier-Stokes model, you end up with that term over there. Usually we approximate these Reynolds stresses shown in the red box using some sort of eddy viscosity model uh, that is using a linear stress strain proportionality relationship, which is what you see over there. So you have ui sigma, sorry, uh, ui dash uj dash, and you're approximating it um, using that quantity you see over there. Now, we've essentially kind of passed the buck. So now the issue is, well, what is that quantity? What is that turbulent viscosity? And that's where you have a series of different turbulence models that have arisen over the last several decades. Um, so for example, there's the spillardle mars turbulence model, where essentially now you're expressing your turbulent viscosity as a function of different constants. And one idea uh, that has been uh, widely uh, used is to propagate the uncertainty in these constants. So, th so the rationalization, if you will, is that these constants come from experiments. Those experiments have uncertainties. Therefore, these constants must have those uncertainties and we must propagate them through. So there's been some work uh, that's been done at that front. However, all the uncertainty quantification techniques that are targeted at propagating uncertainty in these, these constants, um, they still adhere to this linear stress terrain proportionality relationship, which is once again approximation. More recently, there's been some work done by uh, Gianluca Iacorino and uh, co-authors where the idea is to inject uncertainty. So here, this is equivalent to that quantity here where that's a Reynolds stress tensor. And the idea is you perturb both the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors associated with that tensor using uh, higher fidelity simulations like large eddy simulations, direct numerical simulations, um, and part of that process involves uh, some machine learning strategy. And so there are some references that go into, into detail. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm way over time, so I'm gonna close. Um, so I mentioned, or I walked you through three different challenges. How do we accurately measure performance? How do we design with a massive multidisciplinary design space? And how do we develop trust within computational simulations? Um, with regards to the first, the big push is how do we rigorously understand what drives efficiency? And we realize that the focus actually should be on the stagnation temperature measurements uh, and the propagation of uncertainties within that measurement process. With respect to uh, the design space, now that we, we, we have a range of different uh, dimension reduction strategies that we can use, the question is how do we best leverage them and how do we change the way we both design and manufacture? And then finally, um, there's been a ton of work on the aleatory UQ side. More recently, a bit more emphasis on the epistemic side. But what we'd like to do is take them both to empower greater trust, to facilitate greater trust in our computational simulations, which underpin all the above. Uh, I just want to wrap up uh, and acknowledge my collaborators, so Raul and Chirac at Rolls. Uh, Jeff Parts is also my postdoctoral advisor at Cambridge. Paul Constantine at Colorado, Gianluca Yacarina at Stanford, Akil Narayan at Utah, and Tiziano and Irene at the University of Cagliari. <laughs>
technical support and funding for what you've seen has come from Rolls-Royce, so I'm incredibly grateful. Thank you. Uh, and with that, yeah, I'll, I'll take your questions. Thank you.